Welcome everyone officially, and we'll get started now. I want to thank our panelists, um, Chase Anger, Cassandra Bull, Brett Hunter, and Sarah Reinerson Moody. Thanks also to the Dean's Office of the School of Art and Design for co-sponsoring this event, and we're really glad that you're all here to join us. Caitlin and I will be moderating the panel tonight. Um, do we need to introduce ourselves, do you think? Does everyone know us? Might be good to introduce ourselves. Okay. Well, I'm Corey Fecto. I'm the Art Career Advisor and Service Learning Coordinator for the Career Development Center um, and a bunch of other things. But in the interest of time, I think I'll let Caitlin go and then we'll move on to our esteemed panelists. I'm Caitlin Brown. I'm the Communications, Marketing and Outreach Coordinator for the Arts. So that's the School of Art and Design and Performing Arts Division here at Alfred. Okay, so our first panelist tonight is Chase Anger who's the chair of the Performing Arts Division and a professor of dance. Um, she's also the artistic director for the Marla Miller Dance Residency and an international juror for the exhibition of countries and regions at the 2023 Prague Quadrennial and a member of the Niska New York State Dance Force. Chase, can you give us a little bit of information on your experience with grants for the arts? Yep. So I've been on both sides. I'm still on both sides of this process. I uh, am the artistic director for Angel Performance Works, which is my own collaborative work. So I ask for money uh, for that. I am the artistic director for the Marlon Miller Dance Residency Program since 2002. So I am both a curator for that, but I also ask for, I have a fund that helps me bring artists here, but I use that fund to leverage um, to ask for grants for the New York State Arts Council. And so I'm asking for money for that program in addition to having money for that program. Um, I was the curator for foundation, I mean, not foundations, for formations, which was a um, international month long performance or two week long performance event where we had 200 um, applicants for that. So even though that wasn't a grant, it was bringing 200 artists down to 60, but looking at budgeting and feasibility and projects. So it has a lot of crossover with uh, grant writing. I've been on the MAP uh, fund where I was a grant reader and um, I have a long history with the New York Foundation for the Arts. I started there by going to um, a boot camp. Was, you apply and then you get into this boot camp. It was called um, Artists as Entrepreneur Boot Camp. Mm -hmm. It's intensive with that. I highly recommend that foundation, by the way, to for a variety of reasons that we'll get into later. But then after that, I started to work with them and I traveled with them to Guatemala to talk about grant writing and to help train the artists down in Latin America of different ways of uh, grant writing processes. And I also went to Buffalo and to Auburn with New York Foundations for the Arts in order to help artists um, with grant writing and, and with organizations of their work. So I feel like, and then I've got one more gig with the, um, Prague Quadrennial uh, in 2023. But all of these, um, I'm finding a lot of overlap between being an educator, being an a art, artist myself and, and being the head of an arts organization for my own work, but also in trying to support arts in this region and support arts internationally for young and emerging and established artists. So I'm trying, I, I find that it is a very sort of round experience uh, that I have, but it all interconnects. Thank you, Chase. And it looks like, it looks like our tech issues are resolved. So everyone can see your fabulous photo. Oh, thank and you. Your full bio. So thank you for that. We'll move on to our next panelist, Cassandra Bull. Cassandra, Hi. tell thank us a little you. bit more about your experience with grants. We thought that'd be great. <laughs> Excellent, I'd love to. Uh, thank you for inviting me. So I want to preface my introduction by saying that my grant experience has been mostly for community projects. 
through nonprofits. And some of them have been art related, but only because they're steeped in community work. Um, I have no formal grant training, but I really love it. And I've had a lot of successes, so I'm excited to share those. I went to both Alfred University and Alfred State at the same time, and I majored in fine arts and agriculture. I graduated in 2016 and in 2017 started working for Cornell Cooperative Extension, which is like an agricultural research agency through Cornell University. Um, the first day at that job, my executive director told me that she wanted to apply for a grant, and I have been writing grants every day ever since. So for the last four years, I've written about 35 grants out of like 50 or 60 that I've applied for. Um, 35 have been successful and they've been state and private foundations. So most of them are through Cornell Cooperative Extension and they've funded projects like my salary for three years, doing farm to school work. Uh, so working with local farmers and schools to help get local food into schools a commercial community kitchen and teaching kitchen, which is under construction now. And I also write grants for school districts, so getting like commercial kitchen equipment and freezers, as well as school gardens. So maple syrup making, raised bed gardens, hydroponics, beekeeping, uh, chicken coop. And I worked on like a cultural competency and food course in the school. And then the other side of that is like free nonprofit grants that I've written um, through volunteering. So like the Alfred Farmers Market, mm -hmm. an environmental book, book club series. And I helped transform this uh, abandoned lot into a garden. So through that, we've gotten braced beds, water lines, um, outdoor musical instruments, a bronze fountain, a community created mosaic and a pavilion that is under construction. So that's my introduction. Thank you. Thanks. That's great. Our next panelist is Brett Hunter. And Brett, can you tell us a bit about your experience with grants? Um, yeah, sure. I so I've also been on uh, sort of both sides of of this process, um, both in applying for grants and then being on um, grant review panels. Um, the um, largely um, on both sides, um, a lot of that experience has been through the um, NISCA decentralization program um, here, working through um, the local, um, uh, local um, organizations that redistribute grant money. Um, and, um, and then as, as far as, um, so that's one side of, of things. Um, as far as specific arts funding and that that funding um, I've applied as an individual, um, but I also um, work as a director of the Hornell Community Arts Center um, and uh, Broadway Union, which um, is both a physical space and um, a, has a programming arm that sort of um, gets grants to um, bring bring artists in to do projects in Hornell. Um, but also then um, as a part of Broadway Union, um, I've been involved in municipal grants. So um, we, we were successful in getting a um, downtown revitalization grant um, for Broadway Union specifically to help with the building infrastructure, um, as well as then grants that, that fund projects that happen. Um, I also work as a part of um, my collaboratives. Um, we, with uh, Katie Hargrave. Uh, we do a lot of um, projects that involve the intersection of arts and um, sort of community um, infrastructure and community uh, transportation networks. So um, we're involved in a lot of grants that sort of bridge, also bridge these sort of art and municipal um, um, uh, zone. Um, grants that deal with transportation and that sort of thing. Um, and then finally, in the last, um, last um, year, uh, I was a part of a team um, in Hornell that um, applied for and was successful in getting a $10 million downtown revitalization grant for the city. Um, and then also a part of the local planning committee that um, sort of made decisions about how that money, um, so that money we that we applied for as a city, um, then gets redistributed to to projects. So that became a sort of grant review board as as people applied to um, have their projects funded as well. So, 
Thank you, Brett. That's great. Our final panelist is Sarah Reinerson Moody. Sarah, could you tell us a little bit about your experience with grants? Yes. Um, so my name is Sarah Reinerson Moody. I am the current director of sponsored programs for Alfred University, which means all grants. Um, and service agreements come through my office for execution. So we don't necessarily write all of them or any of them at this point, but we facilitate the documentation and the submission of most of them. Um, Chase is an exception. And, um, and then we are on the compliance side for monitoring and we handle all of the fiscal monitoring and review and reporting for those grants. So. Um, expenditures and, you know, budgets, things like that. Mom, before I came to Alfred University, because I'm only coming up on my second year here, or, um, I worked for Hillsborough County in Florida, which is where Tampa is. So um, I was the manager of the Criminal Justice and Grants Management Office. That's one department. My academic background is in criminology, but we oversaw anything from um, court programming to Head Start, to road grants, to HIV programs. A lot of that money comes through counties as uh, formula grants like Head Start, um, but you still have to do all the applications and the compliance and all that other stuff around it as well. So um, I did five years there. And then before that, I was with the University of South Florida working with the VA in terms of being the National Technical Assistance Center for Homeless Veteran Services. They run two programs um, through the VA for homeless veterans and we were their technical assistance center. And then um, I also had a five-year grant with SAMHSA, which is Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, which is part of um, Health and Human Services for the feds. I have um, been funded by grants most of my professional career until now. Um, first time I've not been soft money and um, I've been a reviewer on a number of state and local grant, um, you know, redistribution, you know, application kind of things. And I was a reviewer for the VA for years for our technical assistance center. Um, so most of my strength is not gonna be in art or any subject matter expertise at AU itself. It's gonna be more in the compliance side and um, how to put together a successful application that meets all of the requirements. Thank you. Um, yeah, grants have, I mean, grants from multiple different fields have some stuff in common um, and that, that compliance piece or that documentation piece is a really important one to keep in mind too. So thanks for being here with us, Sarah. So just in terms of managing the, the questions and everything, please use the chat to ask your questions. Um, Caitlin and I will moderate and keep an eye on the chat and um, we may have to combine similar questions. If you feel your question needs a follow up, feel free to put that in as well. Um, we'll start with a few questions that we had in advance. Um, we are recording. <laughs> And um, email cdc at alfred.edu if you would like a copy of the recording. And once it's all compiled and maybe we've figured out how to edit out our, our tech struggles, we'll uh, share that with you all. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. I think the first question that we have for our panelists is how do you find opportunities for grants? Um, I can start off this one. I'm sure the specific art uh, faculty can probably provide some more details specific to art, but um, through my office and through, um, I also work with Brian Shanahan from Advancement who does a lot with foundations. We subscribe of course to um, grants.gov, which is the federal clearinghouse. I recommend everybody sign up for that. It's completely free. They will not spam you. Um, you can put your affiliate as Alfred University, but you don't even need to have an account. You literally can just go to the website, it's grants.gov. Um, and then you have all sorts of search criteria on the left-hand side of that page where you can narrow it down by topic or federal agency. Um, also, you can search keywords, although I will warn you, um, keywords are deceptively challenging with that platform. Um, 
you may, you know, you may put a keyword in like, you know, you think you're going to get a thousand hits and you'll come back with zero. And it's not that they're not out there. It's not that the opportunities aren't available. They just sometimes give things really weird names or codes. But if you know, you know, specifically want to, you know, um, look for a humanities grant or look for an art grant or, you know, the um, Library of Congress has some really interesting things they fund. You can search for them as a grantor on that platform. Um, the other one for the state is called Grants Gateway. It's um, it's okay. Uh, it's but it's officially the state's clearinghouse. Um, and then, as Chase had mentioned, there's um, NISCA, which is the New York State Council on the Arts, and there's also the New York Foundation of the Arts, which is NYFA. Um, and they specifically are grantors or they may have opportunities listed on their website. Another thing to look for is professional organizations. I always try to kind of push this probably more than some other people, but um, whether you're a member or not a member and for students, a lot of times, at least for my field, it's free or it's super, super cheap for an annual membership. Um, and sometimes you can even get that sponsored through different things through campus. Uh, you know, whether that be faculty assistance or they might have opportunities to provide uh, memberships for students on campus. Um, but they always have kind of a what's out and sometimes they'll even send them to you an email every day. So it's just that much easier. For me, I feel like um, you, you have to figure out how much time you have. So if you had like a world of time, there would be a world of rabbit holes that you could go deeply down. I don't have a world of time. So I kind of just go to sometimes the same three spots, uh, which would be Fractured Atlas, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great organization um, that they have Fractured You, they have classes and they have um, uh, webinars, but they also have a whole section on uh, grants for artists. I go to NIFA, which I put down in the chat, and then I go to NISCA, New York State uh, Council of the Arts. And so for me, uh, I know that there are more that I could go to. I know that there are others, but it's like, I don't have time. So I just end up going to those three spots, but those three spots are hubs that then spider out into a, a whole lot of other um, opportunities. But I think for me, I'm gonna talk about time a lot in this hour and a half <laughs> is, um, is you need to know uh, what you want and what you're looking for so that you can use that as a filter to narrow it down. I have read way too many grants of people who like they find a grant and then they try and make their artwork sound like it's you know needed for that grant and it's terrible artwork, it's a terrible proposal. So I think the key is really knowing what you want finding that relationship between that particular grant and your particular idea, but always funded, I mean, always driven by your idea as an artist. I'm only talking, I, I'm talking to artists. I, I don't know anything about science, but, um, and then that filters down your time and then go deeply with a few, you know, those applications versus, otherwise you just get lost out there. It's too, it, it'll, yeah, and it's overwhelming. I think one, one thing that I would add to that is, um, in addition to all the other things that um, were just mentioned, um, I think one of the un, un sort of looked for things is like, every time you find an artist that you like, um, go to their website and look at their CV and then mm -hmm. see where they got grants. Because if, if you respond to their work, um, there's maybe some similarities and to what Chase was talking about, like finding a grant that sort of fits the things that you're interested in. So if another art, artist that is interested in similar things has gotten a grant, um, look at that organization and so on. So it's like just integrating that research into some of the looking that you might already be doing. Yeah, I definitely want to echo that. And also if you go to any shows, maybe if they were funded by a foundation, you can look at that. Um, something I do is go in a Google rabbit hole and I usually type in keywords like region or the topic or the medium um, and sort of sort through what works and what doesn't. 
uh, because a lot of private foundations, I think, are easier to get into as a small, um, maybe starting out writing grants rather than the government or the state ones. Thanks everyone, great advice. Um, and keep an eye on the chat as you're typing your questions in. There's a ton of links and resources in there. So um, we've touched on the writing piece and the management piece. So this might be a good time to ask about um, how do you stay organized when you're, when you're pulling a grant together? Um, there can be a lot of pieces. <laughs> Uh, for some grants, they can be very complicated in terms of all the supporting materials that they want in addition to the narratives and the budgets and all that kind of stuff. So what are your tips for, you know, getting your materials organized? I would say the biggest thing we see through our office is, um, is, is a lack of that organization. And that's usually what ends up what we consider a good application versus the like, we got paid today, so we submitted it um but we don't expect to get the award so um i find like the one thing i always tell everybody who comes through our office is read the application read it more than once and like just like chase said if it does not fit move on um i can't tell you how many times or i mean i, I don't know art as much but or change your idea because if like we have so many people and this used to happen way more when I was a reviewer than thankfully here at AU, but you um, you get these applications that have nothing to do or very tangentially have to do with what they're actually looking for. And so in terms of organization, when I used to write grants, which was my old job, I wrote them all the time, um, read the application. I actually would have like a whole color, I mean, a little obsessive about whole color coordinating thing where like pink was like things that had to be included yellow was highlighted ideas, like things like that. I mean, you don't have to go crazy, but um, the feds usually have a checklist in the back, um, read it again, but also read the application again, because I've totally been burned where something's not on the checklist, but it is in the narrative. Um, and sometimes you print those things out or you're looking up at them online and they're 146 pages and you go, oh, I'm just gonna read like these eight and then look at the checklist and like, don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> It. And especially these days, because I'll see, yeah, Caitlin, it's all about the color coordination. Um, so and, um, sometimes you have to be registered in other sites a certain period in advance. Um, obviously, if you come through our office, we will look at all, and we, we are registered for the most part on most of the sites that um, AU would be, if you were applying through AU, so we would already have those registrations. But, um, you know, if you have to be registered in any of these you know, you go through grants.com or grants.gov, which is a federal site, but you might also need to be registered with SAM, which is Health and Human Services, or, um, you know, DOD has its own clearinghouse, the Department of Defense. And so you, you have to have these other kind of registrations. And so, yeah, just like go read through it and find out and pay attention to page lengths and margins and font sizes and font types, because you will get booted or in some cases we've even run into, it won't even take the application, it rejects it right out of the system. It just says it's non-compliant. Um, sometimes they'll say you have to use these headings, use the headings, answer the question. If it says this is the question, answer that question. You do not need to write a book, answer that question. If it asks you again later and you're like, oh no, I already put that, answer it again. Um, because sometimes the reviewers don't get all your whole application. They might just get your, you know, just get your budget and your budget justification separate than your narrative. So they may not see that you already wrote it at a different part in your application. Um, so yeah, that would be read the application and follow the directions. Um, you're lucky they have a checklist, but don't always count on it. I wanna just echo that because um, that would be what I would say first and foremost is to read the applica uh, application because if you're on the other side and you're writing that application, we are being very, very specific in our language. We have spent a lot of time writing out what it is that we are looking for. So when people don't respond to that, then it just immediately, it gets chucked. And then the other thing that I wanna say um, to what Sarah was saying is about writing style, is it's just about being clear. That is your first and foremost, is to be to use clear, direct language. So this is not the time for poetry or prose. Your artwork, your artistry should go in your artwork, 
but your grant writing should all be about clear, direct language and also um, being really clear about what it is that you want and stating your need. So it's important to say that you need this uh, and why do you need this? Um, but also you have to know what it is you want and you have to ask for you what you want. So this is one last tangent and I'll stop talking is that I, in the very beginning, I was very timid about asking for what I wanted. And I realized later that you don't under ask, like ask for what you need, be, and, but you have to know what you need before you ask for what you need. So be really clear, don't be fearless in asking uh, for what you need. That's it. I guess two two things that I would uh, or echo and and then add um, that are art specific um, is that uh, we we tend to write artist statements and sort of um, ideas about things and and that sort of thing and that is a different that's a different thing that's a different skill set than than writing grants as Chase was saying like there's a functionality to this and people need to know like. What is the thing? What is it going to do? How's it going to happen? Um, and so, so just getting—it's—it's it's a different kind of writing than we're used to doing a lot of times. And so, it's like getting in in that different um, in that different mindset. Um, so, I think that's um, that that's one thing to um, think about. And then, um, and then it's also um, a process of getting used to writing not only to specific topics but also to like specific links. You know, sometimes you'll have an application where it's like respond to this in 200 words or 500 words or those sorts of things. And so getting used to figuring out like how, how do you take a piece of writing and, and really narrow it down to like, what is the thing that I actually need to say in this um, and, not, and not getting lost. So there are just skill sets there that, that take practice and, and sort of um, development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in terms of the process of writing a grant, after I read the RFA or RFP, I sort of parse out what topics I need to write and the character count, and I make a schedule for myself, and I sort of dissect it in the way that the grant makers have illustrated for myself, and I sort of take it piece by piece, bite by bite, and as Brett said, brevity is key. Mm -hmm. Cass, can you define RFA and RFP for us? Sure. So a request for applications or a request for proposal. They're pretty much synonymous, but there are a bit of nuance in there depending on the funder. Yeah. So usually an RFP, they have a solution or they have a problem and they want you to write the solution. So if the problem is, um, and forgive me, I'm going to do a horrible job of trying to make this relatable to art. Um, the RFP could be they want to increase diversity in a programming or bring additional services to like a rural area. We see a lot of stuff with rural kind of um, focus. Um, so that's the problem. They want you to solve that problem. So if you say you want to um, do, you're going after a rural art grant about bringing, you know, enrichment to an elementary school and you're plan is to bring it to Greece Arcadia, that's probably not going to work out as much as if you said Canisteo or, um, you know, one of the other kind of local schools. Um, an RFA or a request for agreement usually says, this is what we want to do and this is how we want to do it. Can you do it and what would it look like? So mm. the agreement usually has more of of formatting in the sense of what they want, not just what they want you to accomplish, but how they want you to accomplish it. And you are agreeing to that. Um, there's some other options too, but those are usually the ones we run into. Great, thank you. We have a really good question in the chat for folks who are just getting started with grant writing and it's about um, smaller, more regional or local grants and how you might go about finding those as opposed to like the, the big statewide agency or, you know, um, national kinds of grants. So one of the things that um, I mentioned before is that, um, so New York State does this, this really great thing for small individual artists and organizations, which is um, the New York State Council on the Arts um, 
decentralizes their their money for individuals um, and um, through this decentralized program. And so um, in the chat, I think Caitlin put up the um, Tri-County Arts Council, which is the arts council that, so they're regional arts councils and they're like two to three counties worth of, of space that each arts council has. And so those arts councils get a chunk of money from New York State and then they redistribute it. Um, and so uh, the, the great thing about those types of grants is that they don't require a status, meaning like you, you don't have to be a non-for-profit organization to apply for those grants. You don't even, um, in, in this case, uh, with the decentralization grants, you, you don't even have to be attached to a nonprofit organization mm -hmm. to apply for them. So as an individual, you can go and, and apply for those monies and, and the organization that's set up are these, are these arts councils. So that's, that's a really great thing about New York state, different states operate in, in different ways, but at pretty much every state has some arts funding arm <laughs> that, that exists. Um, and the good thing about the state organizations is they are focused on the state. So, I mean, it is the state, but they tend to be focused in the state or um, in the various locations um, in the state. So that's a good place to start. Right. I can think you give us um, sorry, Chase, can you give us an idea of what type what we're talking about in terms of funding for those types right. of grants? So most so the um, decentralization grants in general have several categories and they change over time. Um, but the, they tend to be about a, a $5,000. Um, it's a $5,000 limit that you can get in, in a year. And you could have multiple grants that add up to that $5,000. Um, so they'll do like, maybe they have a $500 travel grant or they have a, a $5,000 community arts grant. Um, and so those are sliding scale. So you could apply for 500 bucks, you could apply for 5,000 bucks, that sort of thing. Um, and then in, at those local, those local grants, um, they're also not, um, the, the local organizations can decide to fund partially. You know, so you might apply for $5,000 and then they'll come back and say, we'll give you $3,500. Will you do a project for that? And then you got to go like, okay, well, I can do that, but only this part of it and, and so on. But. but then you can leverage that. And I yeah. think that that was something that I learned as a young artist that I didn't realize. I thought that you, when you applied for grants, if your project cost whatever, $10,000 that you would ask for $10,000. So it kind of goes against what I was just saying, like ask what you need, but nobody wants to be the solo funder. They want to feel like they're putting a little bit of skin in the game. But if you go and you get the smaller grant first from the local arts council and you get, let's say $250, then you go to the next place and you say, hey, I've got, these guys believe in me. I've got $250 from my local arts council. Can you bring, you know, so you want to have, you want to apply to lots of different things for one organization, but it's always good to get the seed money to start. And so for me at AU, having the Marlon Miller Dance Residency Program, having that amount I can then go to the state and say, like, I've got this much and I need this much more to help finish it. Um, but the cool thing about the Arts Council, and I've worked with our Arts Council here, is that they're made out of people. And they're people in that you can, you know, if it's not a COVID world, that you can drive and you can talk and you can meet. So part of it is about creating your pack. Who, is, who are your pack of supporters? for your project, whether it's a community project or an art project or whatever. And so you could actually be in their office or be on the phone or be on a Zoom, talk to them. They know you, they're in your community. They know what the community needs. So as you are asking for something, there's something very tangible and real about that relationship. And that relationship can continue over time. And so maybe you get a grant, maybe the next year you don't, but that, grants person, here's of another grant that they know you would be great for. And then they give you a call and say, you should apply for that. Um, yeah, that's that. I just want to emphasize the, um, I think that finding organizations where you can develop a relationship uh, is important. 
Some people are introverts. So Fractured Atlas, I think is a really good site for them because they're always just online. I never met one person. So I ended up doing my um, fiscal sponsorship through a different organization because I need to have real conversations with real people, but other people don't. So that's also something to think about. Uh, in terms of fiscal sponsorship, um, you can be a small fry and become be part of a 501c3 and take Caitlin's class if you don't know what that is. Like, you can be a small organization and then attach yourself to something um, larger. But then again, that's about finding that real relationship. It's always about finding what it is that you need and then making that connection. Thank you. Let's pause for a moment and define um, fiscal sponsor and talk a little bit about what that looks like. Uh, me or Caitlin or Any Cassandra? Of <laughs> Any of the panelists who want to field this one. Um, well, yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll just say that a lot of grants um, uh, need to, the, the money needs to go to a non-for-profit organization. So 501c3 is a government federal tax uh, designation that is a not-for-profit organization. And there's a lot of requirements for those organizations. Um, but uh, in order to, um, a lot of places that are giving money want that money to go um, to, to be a charitable donation. So they're donating money to a, a non-for-profit organization so that they can get a tax benefit from it. Um, but what that means is that as an individual, um, sometimes it can be hard to um, access that money. So what a fiscal sponsorship is, is essentially an organization that is a non-for-profit like Fractured Atlas, and there, there's a bunch of different ones that say, we will, um, we will sponsor the grant. And so you work with them and, and there's different kinds of relationships. Um, oftentimes they take a cut of the grant um, in order to be the fiscal sponsor. So they make a little money in, in supporting that. Um, but then you're working with them, they're getting the money, they're redistributing it to you. Um, but the grant is, is sort of going through that process. So there's lots of different kinds of organizations that are set up as, as those fiscal sponsors or, or re-granting um, organizations. Thank you, Brett. And Cass, we actually wanna hear from you specifically on this because you have some really creative approaches to fiscal sponsorship um, and, and what to do you know, if you need to kind of uh, generate your own <laughs> fiscal sponsor. Yeah, sure. So I, um, I sort of revitalized a dormant nonprofit when I was in need of a fiscal sponsorship, though not everyone has to do that. Um, I believe creating a nonprofit costs anywhere between $700 to $1,000 in legal fees, um, but I'm sure you can just ask a local community arts organization or a smaller grassroots nonprofit to be your fiscal sponsor. Um, sorry, I had a weird way to go around it which wasn't actually a fiscal sponsorship. It was just uh, taking over a nonprofit organization, but we are interested in being a fiscal sponsor for anyone that wants to do like arts and community stuff in Allegheny County. So we're called Art for Rural America. And I did wanna to touch on the, um, like how to find a local grant. I would say going on what Chase said, it's all about relationships and networking within the community yourself. So um, maybe a local arts organization, you can just say, hey, I have this idea, do you know any grants? Or a mentor of yours, or an artist, or um, just really having the conversation can get you a long way. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one other thing that I'll add about fiscal sponsorship too is that not for every grant, but for a lot of grants, a uh, municipal government can be a fiscal sponsor. And so um, anything that happens, especially around here in a small town, um, that small town can fiscally sponsor a lot of things. Um, and so um, that's something I think people tend to overlook, um, but you can also create there again, those local connections um, that can help you do that. And depending on the city, um, like a lot of the work that we do in Hornell as with the city as a partner, the city doesn't take a cut. 
they just give us the money. Um, and so that's, um, that can be a great thing. <laughs> yeah, coming from a municipality, we, usually, we never took a cut. And if you, we called them fiscal agents, but I think that's just kind of splitting hairs. But um, I would just make sure that nobody ever takes more than 10%. Um, if you start, anyone tries to tell you it's more than 10%, um, feel free to call my office and I'll look through it for you because um, there is some confusion over, and I don't want to get in the weeds. I'm sorry, my kids are home. They're quarantined and they're nuts. Um, so I apologize if you're screaming, if I'm not on mute. Um, we're on day a thousand, I think, of being home. So um, anyways, um, some of them will try to apply their federal indirect rate to be your fiscal agent. And that's an inappropriate cost. And it's usually quite high because it would be their overhead if they were doing the work, but of course they're not. So um, if you have any questions about that, please feel free to call my office, even if it's not through us. Um, in terms of AU, we of course are a nonprofit. And before this, I did reach out to make sure what our policy was about being fiscal agent or fiscal sponsor. And um, what I was told is that if you are running the grant through AU and you're using campus or students, or it's somehow linked back to the university, then we can be um, the fiscal agent or fiscal sponsor. But if it is a private work that you are doing outside of AU, you know, your own private artwork or you know, a mural for the city or whatever, but it doesn't actually tie back into campus or our students, um, then we can't be. So, so lots of options, which is great. One thing that we've touched on a little bit here and there is assistance with um, the grant process, right? So Chase had talked about this a little bit with connecting with local arts councils. Sarah, your office provides some assistance as well, um, especially for folks who are new to this and are feeling maybe a little bit intimidated with the process. What are some of the resources that you've used to help with the grant writing, managing process? Um, the number one free thing I would say is read another successful application. A lot of times, especially um, government, whether that's you know, county, state, or federal, they have to publish their uh, awards. So you can get, or I mean, they're either directly on the website, super easy, look them up, click on it, or you can request copies of successful applications and then look at what somebody else wrote, like the language they used, what they included, what it looked like. I mean, they already won, so you know that's what they were looking for. Sorry. Um, the other thing is um, there are professional organizations that offer assistance and um, I can send you guys a list of that. Thanks, Sarah. Anyone else? You're doing great, Sarah. You're <laughs> doing great. My God, I had to go to another building because of my dog. So I hear you. It's not the same, I know, but um, I, the only thing that I would say is to uh, know your skill set. And I'm a big collaborator. So I like to work with a group of people. Uh, I have become, you know, a good writer for these things, but I didn't start out as a good writer. So I uh, have friends that are great writers. And so I send my stuff. Eliza Beckwith, who is on here, uh, she's read my stuff before. Um, Kathy Noonan has read my stuff before. Like I just send it out to get edited by people that happen to be really good writers and then do some sort of barter, like, you know, watch their kids or whatever, like figure out a system. Um, but I do think that knowing your skill set's important. The other thing is uh, what Brett had talked about, about practice. You're not gonna be good at it at the beginning. It takes lots of practice. You just, the only way to get good at it is to do it over and over and over again. And then when it comes to budgets, um, the thing that helped me is this idea of budgets telling a clear story. You wanna think of your budget as a story and what is it gonna say? I used to look at budgets and numbers and forms and not apply to things because I was too intimidated. But once I started to like, be a little less fearful. And I went to that boot camp or I read a book or I, you know, did a webinar. You get better at that as you practice more. And I think the key thing there, in addition to asking for the money you need, but also artists, 
ask for the time you need. So don't say that like, oh, you can do this project in a month when really you need three months. If you need three months, ask for three months. So always ask for the amount of time uh, that you need, know your skill set, uh, and be part of a, a collaborative group is my advice. Um, I'll, I'll just add a, a simple thing uh, for arts grants is to find somebody that's not an artist to read it, and mm -hmm. then they go like, "What? What the heck does that mean? <laughs> like, what are yeah. you? What are you actually talking about? You know?" So I think that that's a simple thing. Um, and then Caitlin just mentioned that um, there again with the local um, arts councils, uh, they will often allow you to sub submit a proposal and they'll read it and they'll give you feedback, um, which is really great. Um, and then also uh, with the local arts councils, oftentimes if you don't get a grant, they'll, they'll send you a little, a few sentences and say, here's why you didn't you know, and that's really helpful as well. So even just going through those processes and connecting with those local arts councils um, it can be really handy. Yeah, and what Brett said about the feedback, um, I always say no application is ever wasted because you can always use that application or a variation on that application again. So if you have something that, you know, a project you're really passionate about or that you, you know, wanna try again in the future, um, we use the same applications all the time or, or variations of them. Um, if we are unsuccessful, we take the feedback and make the corrections or the adjustments and um, put them back out. So none of it is wasted. Um, so, you know, like I said, it, it's all building. And um, I think Chase was 100% right about the budget and in time. If any time you're going to do collaborations, always factor in that startup time or, or um, getting organized time because even though maybe you think, okay, we're gonna start this mural project or we're gonna you know, start this club, but, you, but you're collaborating with other organizations or other groups, it always takes longer than you think it's gonna take. Mm -hmm. Actually get started and make sure your materials are covered. I can't tell you how many times we under budget materials um, because they think they're gonna use their own stuff or they're gonna use stuff they have somewhere else. And, there's, you know, one always ends up being a cost to the organization or to you personally that you shouldn't have to, um, you know, incur. But two, again, it doesn't tell that story. If I know you're trying to build something or make something or create something and your materials budget's really low, um, unless you're explicitly gonna say, I'm using materials that were donated or they're, you know, materials are gonna be counted as my match or whatever, like put them in there because otherwise it's a review or I'm gonna wonder how you can do the project without it. And they look for that feasibility. Is your project feasible? Is your pro, I mean, and when I look at through, when I'm on the other side and I'm reading, I'm like, this project's not feasible. They haven't asked for enough money. They haven't, they don't understand time. They're not ready yet you know, and then you move on. So feasibility is really important. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about in-kind contributions, matching contributions with that feasibility piece. Can you talk a little bit about that aspect and how you show, you know, Chase, you mentioned, you alluded to this earlier with getting smaller grants and that adding them into bigger grant proposals as you're sort of scaling up to larger grants. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll I'll just say that it's sort of related to that is like often um, a lot of grants are aren't just giving you money, but you're they're giving you a certain portion of the money. So it's a seventy five um, or it's a twenty five percent match. So they're going to give you seventy five percent of a budget, but you have to prove that you've got the extra twenty five in in value um, and that's where things like in-kind um, donations can come in so an in-kind is basically anything that's not cash um, and so for instance you say like well i'm going to get these materials donated and those materials have this value i'm going to get this service donated and that has this value you may have you may have your own sort of um, uh, facilities in in some way you're saying okay i'm going to use this workshop and, and that, that's sort of this value. So there's lots of different ways um, you can generate in-kind um, value to things. Um, you have a partner um, that's going to provide a service, et cetera. Um, so thinking about not just the value in cash of things, but the value 
of, of all the bits that, um, that you're going to use. I have this box of screws already and I'm going to use it. So that's worth $5, you know, et cetera. And it's also your time, you know, mm -hmm. don't underestimate the value of your time. So a lot of times when we're putting applications in, um, people's hourly wage or projected hourly value becomes that in-kind match, um, whether that's students or faculty, um, when match is required. But the other thing, and I'll just, because I've seen people get small, especially small companies get burned by this, if there is no match requirement, if there is no in-kind or, um, you know, don't commit to it. I mean, you may still be doing it, but you don't have to put it in the application um, unless you really know you're going to do it. Because I've seen people, um, and this was more for HIV programming, um, not the actual medical services, but programming around HIV awareness and things like that. They put in, oh, you know, we're going to do a thousand hours of outreach and volunteer. And this is over multiple counties and blah, blah. And they put it in as, as um, an unrequired match component. But then when they actually went to go do the program, they, they came up with a different format that was actually brilliant and it was so much more effective, but they weren't putting a thousand hours in. And they committed to that in their budget, um, even though it was in kind, it was still part of the contract. Because remember, anything you submit that gets accepted becomes part of your contract. And so um, that is gonna be what I always call the Bible for your grant is the RFA or RFP or the solicitation is kind of the general word. Um, and then your application, that's the agreement that you have with your sponsor. And so, um, whereas, you know, I've seen people undervalue their project in nobody, I've never heard of anyone getting in a reward because they were a good deal. Um, I see that a lot more with our science faculty, but they're like, oh, it's really like a $500,000 project, but I'll just ask for 250 because, and I'll put all my salary in as in-kind match because it's a good deal. I've never, ever, ever had anyone come back to me and say, we awarded you because of the value of, because we usually come back to us and they go, how the heck are you going to do a $500,000 project for $300,000? Um, you know, how are you going to um, pay for this faculty's time or, you know, you're the PI, which is a fancy word for you're in charge of the project. And um, how are you gonna do that if you didn't put any time on and you didn't put any salary on it? How are you gonna work on this? So um, just be very cognizant of what you're agreeing to and what you're promising. Um, and don't, if it's not required and you don't know that you're going to make it, don't put it in there. Yeah, and this is a little in the weeds, but going off of what Chase said, sometimes you can leverage grants on grants, but it depends on who the funder is. So you can't always leverage a New York grant and a New York grant at the same time, or a federal and a federal. Um, it really depends, and I don't think that we should be scaring any of you with the match. They will be explicit um, in the solicitation for if that's required, and then you can sort of deal with it when that comes. So there's a couple questions that we have that relate to this topic. The first one is about paying yourself, right, as part of the grant. So including that in your grant proposal. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you do that? You get older. <laughs> you get older. Like when I was younger, I mean, I never asked. I always paid my dancers. I never paid myself. You know, that was the cutting thing. And then, um, yeah, it took me a long time to be able to put myself, uh, to put my payment in there. And uh, I think, you know, I never pay myself very much, but I think that you should, but I always think that you should look for um, what is the value of the opportunity? So as emerging artists, I don't know how many of you are emerging and how many of you are established, but I think when you're an emerging artist, I'm not saying you should undercut yourself, but I think that there'll be opportunities for you that might not come with money and you shouldn't turn it down just because it doesn't come with money. I think you just have to look at the value of the opportunity 
And is that opportunity going to be something that can move you forward or connect you or be another line on your resume or get another great documentation? Um, in terms of uh, in-kind, that finding out, oh, it's echoing now for some reason, finding out um, that goes back to the budgeting and your budgeting being a story. So I have, I learned how to pay myself by putting it first in the in-kind and then switching it from the in-kind to the budget. But it's really important, not only before you do a project, but after you do a project to then go back, dissect that project, see where you actually spent money, see what you projected was more or less than what you thought it would be and learn from each grant that you do. So that's why I feel like starting smaller and then learning from that and then going a little bigger and then learning from that and scaling up like Brielle, you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, yeah, and I, again, I think it's um, practice. You get better at it each time you do it. And again, it's working with other people who have skill sets that you can learn from. And it's about asking for help. Uh, asking for help from the local arts council, asking for help from your friends, asking for help from, uh, you know, professors or whomever, but um, finding that group of people. I wanna make one quick plug for the young students or older people. I found these books to be really helpful. This is Making It as an Artist and it's free and you can download it for free or you can buy this little book that only takes you a couple hours and it's seven dollars so that's my little plug i think this book is great for getting started um so i, I <laughs> wait what are we talking about again um i got lost yourself. oh yeah paying yourself right so here um <laughs> sorry so here's here's this like really stupid thing that's really important as an artist and that is that we have a terrible uh, we do a terrible job of estimating the time it takes to do a thing. And so the really stupid thing is next time you start a project, keep a timesheet and just say like, I'm going to, I'm going to do this project. And every time I work on it, I'm going to write it down. I worked on two hours, three hours, et cetera. And you add it up and then you go like, holy crap. Um, that took a lot of time. And then the, the other time is when you start the project, um, ask yourself, how long is this going to take me? And write that number down and then keep track of it. And they'll be really different. So I, I think one of the things that I've, I've figured out just recently in trying to be an adult is like, um, is like once you actually have that actual information, then it becomes way easier to then go back and say like, okay, now I'm going to do a project, which is kind of similar. How, what, what time is that actually going to take? Rather than just being like, I don't know, five hundred dollars, great, you know. So actually finding um, finding the time it takes you and keep making that a part of your process um, makes it way easier to value um, the time that it takes. I will say, Brett, it can't be just artists because I know a bunch of engineers <laughs> into this problem too. Um, yeah. And it's not just the making of the work itself, which is what all the engineers seem to fall into. They know exactly how long a test takes, but they have no idea how long it's gonna take them to write that report or provide that analysis or be in those meetings or on those phone calls or status updates or all of that extra kind of administrative burden. So as you're looking at your time, um, it's not just the time to do the actual work, it's the other time as well, because all of these will have either some sort of outcome, output, or report, and so there will be hours attached to that, and that is something, um, yeah, I mean, it's, if you want to, like, like, lawyers and social workers do a great job keeping track of their time. Um, I'm not either, but they do a really, really good job of keeping track of exactly how long it takes them to do things. And so I think, I think Brett's idea is spot on. Um, I'll yeah, also so speaking. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say speaking as the person who does not pay herself for much of her work. I think there's something to be said about uh, like the beauty of volunteering. And if you have a position 
that pays you and you also want to do this thing and it's for a greater cause, like you should do that. And if the fine line of the maximum budget you can apply for is the difference between paying yourself and um, like about what is to you more so than the money. And piggybacking on that, I think it's about working on other people's projects. So as I'm saying, like you need to bring people into your project, it has to go the other way too. So you need to go to everybody's shows. You need to be calling them up and saying like, do you need help installing this? Or do you need help carrying these materials? Like it is a community. And I feel like now more than ever with all the different things going on, it is about the community, not only the community of artists, but how we as artists can attach to the larger community, whether it be the, the community of place or maybe a community of idea, but it, it also involves generosity, generosity of time and generosity of your expertise and then people working together. Um, so uh, two other things I just put in the chat, there's an organization um, called WAGE um, and it's an artist run um, organization that mm -hmm. has um, sort of fee schedules based on sort of what you're doing for an organization and the size and budget of that organization that's specific to arts related things. Um, so that's a good resource to be like, I'm going to, I'm proposing this and it's with this kind of organization, how much should I be expecting. Um, so that's, um, that's one thing to, um, to think about in terms of pay. The other, the other secret I would say in, in an art project is that um, the money that you're paying yourself um, is also kind of unrestricted money, meaning that you may have in your budget laid out like I'm going to spend this much on this and this much on this and this much on that, and then I'm going to pay myself X. Well, that X that you're getting paid, you can also spend on the project when the project changes a little bit, but you didn't mm. budget for it and so mm. on. Um, and so that that's both the freedom, but it's also the reality that oftentimes you're not getting paid because partway through you're going like, but I really want it to be this too. And then you mm -hmm. spend that money to make the project, but it but it's an experience, right? And that's, and, uh, and that's valuable as well. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about that is that um, there's a tax implication to that as well. Like when you're getting money uh, from a grant, that's income. Um, and generally it's income that you're not taking taxes out of. Um, and, but if you're also reinvesting that, uh, that income into your art practice, so you're getting paid, but then you're buying a piece of equipment or, or that sort of thing, then you can deduct that again. So that's a whole other set of weeds to get into is the tax implications of, <laughs> of this stuff. Important stuff to keep in mind. Um, I just wanna make sure we give full attention to Brielle's question about scaling up. because we've talked about everything from a few hundred dollar grants to $10 million grants so far in the chat. So those of you who've been at this grant writing thing for a while, um, how, did you, how did you make those moves from you know, more, maybe smaller, more local, decentralized grants to larger projects? So for, I come from, you know, social sciences background. We just, we served more people, um, provided additional services. So, you know, um, right before we, back to talking about building on grants, right before I left my old job, we started a mental health court for adults. It's a state grant, 1.2 million. Um, we could serve 40 people. And we, it was like a super intensive residential treatment for persons with psychotic breaks who then committed crimes. Um, and then we got another grant from the feds for about four million more dollars. And so what we did is then we expanded it to serve children. So we could clearly delineate the state grant being adults, persons 18 years or older with these specific diagnoses who were in this uh, felony program through mental health court. And then the federal grant, which was persons 17 years and under um, who were in a felony court for for um, minors and who had a certain diagnosis. And so that's how we kind of scaled up and scaled down is either you serve more people, we provide additional services or potentially more locations. 
Um, so for art, if you are going to have a program, are you going to you know, host that program more than once or in more than one location? Increase the number of participants in it, meaning the actual people involved in the production, or are you offering it to a larger audience? Um, or are you making more products? So instead of one piece of art, are you making more than one piece of art? Things like that. And that's usually um, when people have to scale up or scale down, those are usually the things that we kind of look at in terms of how to do it. I just uh, I just asked um, recently asked this question in uh, one of my classes, which is like, if you had five dollars, what art would you make? And if you had ten dollars, what art would you make? And if you had a thousand dollars, and if you had a hundred thousand dollars, and like we we got to about fifty thousand dollars, and everybody just lost. Like, who knows? I have no idea even how to conceptualize that. Um, and so I think part of part of the process is is almost just uh, I think with art projects is, is to continue to ask yourself that so you're applying for a five thousand dollar grant and do that but then go like okay if I had twenty thousand dollars what would I do with this project and just to kind of keep that in in the back of your mind because that's a really hard we we get so used to I think in the arts like making do with whatever we've got that it can be really hard to make even just that mental step to be like if I did get everything I wanted what what would it be um, and and to write about that or to think about that as as you go to make those transitions easier I I do that a lot with um with my students, I have them sketch and I give them a million dollar budget. And then they go out and sketch a proposal for a million, I mean, not a grant proposal, but just an idea, a creative an idea of what would you do with a million dollars. And I think that's just a fun, you know, party trick that you can do all the time um, in a variety of places just to keep that skill set going. I also think that it's um, good to work on other people's projects um, in terms of grant writing, because like it's really easy to sell other people sometimes. It's hard to ask for things for yourself or it's hard to sell your idea. And I think you can get practice by um, working on somebody else's and like somebody else's that you're really excited about. But, but work on that grant for them and then help. And then that gives you the practice so that by the time it, you're, you have to ask for yourself, you're that much more comfortable with that action. Yeah, so um, I wanna say maybe two things about this. Uh, one is about the iterative process. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something to be said about having a small grant and doing a pilot project and um, maybe having a success and saying, what could this have looked like if I added more or if it was $20,000? And then using that proof of concept as leverage for why you can be trusted to expand and why you want to expand. Um, and then the second goes back to collaboration. So yes, there's working on someone else's project, but there's also finding a team to work on the same project together um, as, as owners or maybe a nonprofit that has clout or has already um, groups that they're working with that you can collaborate with for the scaling up success. Thanks everyone. Um, um, can I, uh, I'll just add oh, one other quick thing to that. And yeah. that is that um, part, part of scaling up and I think this comes out of, out of being an artist too is like we're used to doing the thing and doing it in our own ways. And part of scaling up is actually that you don't do it all. Um, you have other mm -hmm. people that do parts mm -hmm. of it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and, and the thing though, is that when other people do parts of it, they actually need to get paid. <laughs> and so you can decide not to pay yourself, but don't decide not to pay somebody else. Um, and so part of that scaling up is distributing that labor and getting enough money that you can do that. So we have a great question about, you know, once you get a grant, yay, you got the grant. Now, what does that communication ongoing relationship look like with the grant funding organization? And maybe we can talk a little bit about 
timelines too, because when we're talking about grant funded projects, we're talking about like a much longer scale of time than perhaps people are used to. I would say the first thing is, of course, is go back to your solicitation and your application because um, they may have reporting requirements or communication requirements built in um, when you need to be sending things. Um, something else I kind of just had on my list to talk about that, that I think fits into this category is be very, very careful about the language in terms of being paid up front versus re reimbursement based. So most grants that I see, and I, I don't know specifically for art grants might be a little different, but um, they're reimbursement based. And so you have to put out the money and then ask for reimbursement and you have to substantiate that with actual costs. And so receipts, um, you know, invoices from if you do have a third party that's doing some of the work, things like that. And so be very, very careful not to, you know, when I used to work for the county, people would call all the time, you know, they, the Board of County Commissioners yesterday approved a new project and they approved $50,000 in funding. And then my phone would ring today and they'd go, where's my check? Like, no friend, you have to do the work first. You do the work and then you send us the invoice and we pay the invoice. And so um, I, you know, there may be, especially those low dollar ones where maybe they'll, they'll, you know, I'm thinking of a couple right now that have come through art this year that they've paid us up front. Um, but be careful of that and be careful of how you are um, retaining all of your receipts and all of your invoices and tracking your hours so that you can substantiate all those costs because no matter how they pay you, you're going to have to substantiate them sooner or later as part of your reporting. Um, and that's even for foundations and usually foundations get kind of wonky. So um, I would just say make sure you read that. Like some of them will have 90 day reports. Some of them just may have a report, you know, depending on how long your project is, may just have a report in terms of you know, when your invoices have to be submitted, but it might not be like a formal written report. Some of them may want to see previews or um, you maybe have to produce a program to show them that you put on a certain event, um, things like that. So just look early and write it down. What are those requirements that you, you know, will have to be able to meet at some point in the future? All the institutions that you're applying for are made out of people, whether it's a federal one or a state one or a local one, whether it's big or small. And the key is you want to have a relationship. I'm going off of your question, Susanna. So uh, you will have to do a report at the end, um, but I think sometimes it's really good for the project to work backwards. Like this is when the project is done. So this is when I have to do my PR. So this is when I have to ask for the money. So this is when I have to... So again, it goes back to making sure that you have enough time. So work backwards with that, but also after the project, you have to uh, do your reporting. So you do need to stay organized. And like anything, you want to be easy. You want to be... Uh, to turn your reports in on time to stay, you know, to stay in connection so that they have a good experience with working with you. You invite them to the show, you write a handwritten, you know, note afterwards. Uh, you do all of those things like you would do in any relationship when you're networking, that's genuine, of course. And then um, even if you can't apply again, let's say they have a year, limit like if you applied last year and you got it you can't get it for two more years or whatever they still have phone conversations and talk about other people and recommend other people so it's really important to be you know to be really nice to be really clear to be really responsible so that they will recommend you to other people I guess one other thing I would add with um, a lot of um, arts grants, um, local and regional arts grants, is those grants tend to be looked at by local and regional artists. Um, and so they are, again, being connected to the people in, in, in your community in, in a big way um, can, can help with that, um, but also realizing that um, 
that the um, grant panels that are looking at them often change. Um, so just because one year you don't get something doesn't mean you're never going to get it. Um, so continue to to apply for things. So that's slightly off topic. Um, but I think that the the main thing I would say about um, the post grant thing is that as as much as possible, it's about that organization on, on the front end and going like, okay, this this final report isn't due till a year from now, but what am I going to need for that report? And like, can I make a little folder for my receipts? And can I make a little folder for um, my images? And and trying to, as much as you can, organize that information ahead of time that, so you can dump it someplace. So when you need it, it's there and you can, you can make those reports. Yeah, and anytime there's a change, a substantive change to your project, your program manager is your person. Um, if for instance, you like some grants will allow you to change money between lines and by lines, I mean, usually when you put your budget together, you have like a supplies line, a personnel line, equipment line, travel line, those kind of things. They'll, they'll tell you how they want the money split out. And a lot of times they'll say, you know, if it's within this certain dollar value or a certain percentage, you as the person who's overseeing your program can make those changes. So, you know, it's five bucks different, it's fine. Um, but sometimes they'll say like, you know, if it's, if you wanna move money off of another line and put it into personnel, you have to ask with for a grant adjustment is what they're called. And um, so I would just say, anytime you're gonna have a, like a significant delay or you have a question or um, you wanna move line item, you know, budget between different functions more than just a few dollars, just reach out to your program manager person, um, get their okay, get it in writing, um, just in case they leave or go on maternity leave or anything else because it has happened. Um, and then that way you're always covered because especially with these small dollar grants, I just don't wanna see any of you losing money on the opportunity. Yeah. One thing I want to add, so yeah, transparency is key. I would say never hide anything from a funder. Um, and so as an artist who gets an arts grant, I think documentation is also really special. So there's thanking your funder. Maybe that's in a press release, most often approved by them. Um, and yes, it's a narrative final report or interim report. It's also taking pictures of your process and posting about them or taking a video of what it takes for you to make the piece or of the piece in action or installed. Um, last week, one of my funders that funded a grant two years ago reached out to me and said, Good Morning America wants to do a special on our grant. Do you have any videos? And I said, yes, because we have videos and we keep them stored. And so having that relationship and that documentation for you to pull out in your practice and then for them to use um, to talk about the good things they do in the community is also another really special um, thing to remember after you've been awarded. And it's easy now. I was doing VHS tapes. I was making VHS tapes and having to transfer one to the other and labeling them all and then sending them in an envelope to people. So like nowadays, yeah, take some video. <laughs> um, one, one, other, one other thing I would add in sort of circling back to this idea of writing a grant and, and you know, there again with an arts grant, like one of the things that's different is that oftentimes we're writing a grant for a project that we haven't done. And so that's very different than writing a statement about a thing that you're reflecting on. Um, so this idea of writing about something that you haven't done yet, and as an artist, like, you know, things may iterate and things may change uh, along the way. And so there is, a, as I said before, the grant is about saying like, this is the thing I'm going to do. But there's this sort of nuance to um, writing about the thing that you're going to do in a definitive enough way that it seems real, but also trying to give yourself a, some room to understand that it's a creative endeavor and there will be some nuances and changes to it so that you're not always like going like, well, at every day I've got to call up my administrator and be like, so yeah, now it's this and now it's that. But how, how do you sort of create language that 
um, allows you some room to make the decisions that you need to make along the way. So that's another practice and nuance kind of thing <laughs> that you get into. All right, we've got room for a final question. So if you've been holding off on asking a question, type it into the chat and we'll make sure we get that answered before we wrap up this evening. I guess, are there any apps or tools or techniques that folks use to help stay organized? We've talked about some of the, some of the tools earlier, but is there anything else you wanna share with the group while we're waiting to see if we have a final question? Ask Brett, he's good at that. I'm terrible at that. So I've become better at it and I'm trying to like, but I'm, you know, Caitlin made me go on to the Outlook now. And so it just, it's, yeah. I sympathize with any of you who are having trouble with media management. I feel you, you have my love and support, but not any advice. <laughs> So I, I would I would say one you know there again one one simple thing that and and this is this is super nerdy but um, is file naming I feel is really really essential and so deciding on a system uh, of how you name your files and and so I mean if if you look at my computer I have absurd file names that that tend to be very long but. But what it is, is you actually want to make your files searchable because you won't remember where they are. But if you know that every, everything related to this project has a like, you know, grant 2021 on it, and then you search grant 2021, that, that will show up. So as there again, another thing about just thinking ahead and going like one day, I'm gonna forget where this is and need to find it. So how can I name it in a way that, that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, we track hundreds of projects. So we, you know, besides obviously Banner, um, we have um, some software, but it's probably not necessary for an individual level um, of tracking. Um, my husband used to be in sales and we used to use Expensify, which is an app and it's free if you use like less than 50 receipts a month or something. Um, and it's just a receipt tracker in terms of expenses. It's more about taxes. But um, I will warn you, having lived through this for a decade already, those heat transfer receipts, about a couple hours in your pocket and you can't read them anymore. So um, scan your receipts, scan them early. Um, they are still absolutely valid in a PDF. You don't need like, no, I've never heard of anyone asking for the actual like hard copy receipt, but yeah. I uh, personally have had huge problems with our taxes in previous years because I go to pull out, you know, 12 months of receipts and they're all blank because the heat paper is given away. So um, otherwise, I mean, just Excel, um, if you're super fancy access, but I mean, if you need like relational data, but I think Excel is probably enough for tracking dates and the limited expenses you would have on that. Got another vote for Excel from Brett. And me. And Chase. And I'm not good at Excel at all, but I know enough to do this and to do this and to do, so I know enough to actually make it work. And I'm terrible at that, but I always do well with the money. Like I always am very clear with the money, even though I'm not clear with the, uh, even though I have very simple technological skills. All right, so I'll turn it to our panelists at this point. Any last words of wisdom you want to impart to us before we wrap up for the evening? I think part of grant writing is part of the research is, again, going deep inside yourself, like what it is that, or deep inside your collaboration, as Cassandra was saying. Mm -hmm what is your project or your collaborative body or your idea truly about? What does it truly need in terms of money and time? And then go for there, but like, don't immediately jump out into that other world, I think. And sometimes you discover it along the way. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to know everything beforehand, but just keep recircling back to asking that question. And then I think it's about um, being really honest, clear, organized, and generous. Mm. 
I would I would say one one other thing is that um, grants are great and and money is great, but they they come with other strings. And so like just as Sarah was saying, like don't be like I maybe could do that and like uh, try to apply for a grant and and sort of waste your time, but also realize like if you're if you're really trying to shoehorn something in and you get that grant, then do you actually want to do the project that you've proposed, right? And so trying to find the places that the thing you want to do matches with the priorities of the organization that, that's giving the, that funding. Because sometimes having money is worse than not having money <laughs> if, if you're stuck doing a project um, that you don't want to do. So, um, so really just to sort of back to Chase's idea of like thinking about your priorities um, what, what you want to do, what you need to do it, and, um, and being clear on some of those things going in. Yeah, I would reiterate what Brett and Chase already said, just um, be clear with what your expectation is of the project and what you can accomplish. Tell the story and both the narrative and the budget um, in, you know, if you want, you know, don't go after things that you're not capable of or that don't fit that mission. I've seen a lot of people try to take what I would consider kind of art grants and go after technology opportunities and not have the technology background to really um, back up those applications. You know, if they're looking for you to develop programming around AI and what you really want to do is you know, develop this really cool video game graphic, like you might not have the techno technological capabilities to be doing AI or to be, you know, um, you know, going through with what the intent of the grant is. And the worst, worst case scenario I've ever seen is people have to pay it back. And it's absolutely devastating both to institutions like universities and especially to individuals to have to pay that money back. So I think I want to finish this uh, this panel with maybe a little bit of heart. So I certainly have written grants. The first ones I've written have not been feasible. They've probably not been well written. Um, and they've just been really naive. But I think they were awarded because they made people feel something. And they made people feel good about the project and the potential and like what they are as a funder providing their money into a community or into an individual to make good work um, for the sake of making something special. Um, so I always say that writing a grant is like writing your hopes and dreams on paper and maybe someone gives you money to do it. Um, so take everything we've said and sort of just go with what your heart says. Thank you. That's great. So we're out of time. I, I hate to stop the conversation because I feel like there's just so much wisdom in this in this Zoom space here. But thank you so much to our panelists for their time and their generosity, sharing their expertise with us. Thank you to everyone who attended tonight. Um, we appreciate your great questions and your attention and your time. And again, thank you to the SOAD Dean's Office for co-sponsoring this panel. Um, email cdc at alfred.edu if you want a recording and uh, we will get that out to you at some point soon. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thank you. Crackers now. Been <laughs> oh my gosh, Brielle, I miss you so much. I can't even stand it. Like it's just awful. I miss you too. Thank you guys. Brielle so and I saw that. each other in the restaurant and we just started crying. Oh. We just like <laughs> crying. I just, oh my gosh. Okay. Hey guys, thank you so much. I hope that was what you guys wanted. It was so okay. good. Thank you. Brielle. Okay. Nice work. Thanks. <laughs> I didn't do anything. I just sat here and took notes the whole time. <laughs> you, asked, you asked a really important question that got it started. So it's, yeah. yeah. Thank you guys. And thanks for everybody for participating. This is amazing. And I have to like watch it 10 times to soak it all in a little bit more. <laughs> so thank you guys. Oh, you're welcome. Good to see you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Ethan, do you have a question?
No. <laughs> okay, so we'll figure out the rest of this tech piece and get it sent out. And what a lovely, generous, and helpful conversation. Yeah. It was, uh, Corey, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. My pleasure. It's what a great group.